Thanks very much, uh, Data Bricks, for allowing me to come and talk to you through Booper's Data Lakehouse journey. Um, I'll start with um, a small dad joke, if I may. So for all of those who are potentially going to snore during this, please try and do so quietly so you don't wake up the person next to you. So that's the first thing I'll ask. Um, when I go through the, 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 the agenda for you, effectively what I'll be doing is talking about who are Booper, um, both globally and in the APAC region, and some of our problem statement. The value proposition that both Databricks, but also to, to another extent, Microsoft bring. Um, some of the overview of our usage so far, and we're still fairly embryonic, and then focus on the customer lifetime value uh, model that we're using and some of the successes off the back of that. Okay, so Bupa, um, 6.5 million customers. We do health insurance and health services globally, but in Asia Pacific, in Australia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong, um, not only is it health insurance, but we support the Australian Defence Force, uh, visa medical services for those individuals who are looking at permanent residency, aged care facilities in both Australia and New Zealand, um, and optical and dental networks as well. So fairly large size, lots of diverse products that we offer across them. Fairly large uh, volume of individuals, 22,000 people who actually work for, for Bupa. That's great, and we're a really large company, but we've also had some issues, and one of those issues is actually landing on the cloud and having a good data outcome. And we've had a few problems in that because over the course of time, we've acquired lots of legacy platforms just as everybody else has, and trying to integrate them has kind of proved problematic and both difficult. We've also had a few iterations where we've tried to uh, operate on the cloud and they've been fairly unsuccessful. Our data management lifecycle was quite immature before, and data democratization was probably more of a desire. I'd say that was before I came in, and I joined in December. So uh, if you indulge me slightly. So since that time, we've done um, a review of the technical landscape, and off the back of that, we've determined that we were looking to utilize uh, a lake house facility on the Azure cloud. Uh, within that, we've managed to uh, work forward with Databricks to, to get to the outcomes we're at today, which I'll explain as we go forward. Okay, as part of um, any implementation that you've got, you're looking at what does that bring for you, what's the outcome you've got, et cetera. So the first thing I'll start with is the value proposition. So we've got a strategic alliance with both Databricks and, as I mentioned earlier, Microsoft. That's incredibly important to us. It's so important that we actually look to invest in a multi-year deal with Databricks on a reserved instance over a three-year time period. Um, on the back of that, we got above-the-line savings, and we also got below-the-line assistance with regard to professional services, which I'll come on to a little bit later on. Within that as well, we're looking at the L&D proposition, and many of you have taken certifications yesterday um, as one of those outcomes. Um, we've also had individuals undertake them in public, uh, forums previously, there's meetups there, and there's also private ones that are available to Booper because of the scale that we're looking at to do. Outside of that, um, we're looking at other areas where we've, we've gone really well in the value proposition. So for us, they've been strong outcomes, but also the architecture is a really strong outcome for us. So the Medallion architecture is bronze, silver, gold. Um, I'm not sure if it's a coincidence or not, but actually our products are gold, silver, and bronze as well. Um, but it fits nicely with us because the analytics and insights fit more towards bronze and silver, and as you start moving towards the business community, that comes to become more of an outcome from a gold perspective. We also use Databricks on the Azure platform for ingestion. That works really well for us as well. Um, in fact, it works so well that we've ignored using Synapse because we get better processing outcomes through Databricks. Um, and it's optimized, it's fully optimized on there. We use Databricks uh, from a Unity catalog perspective and we also use Microsoft Purview as well. So from a governance and data management oversight, it gives us the ability to make sure that we're democratizing data safely. So we're getting the right information to the right people in a secure manner by having those role-based access controls overlaid above them, utilizing these outcomes. And there's an aligned roadmap. You've just heard Bonnie earlier, but you've also seen more recently that MLflow 2.0 
that's just been released. Obviously, we're using ML Flow at the moment, but you know, clearly that's an upgrade and that's something that we'll be looking to use going forward because we have machine learning models and we're looking to produce more and more of those models on Databricks. So from a perspective of, of us with regard to the work that we're doing on, on Auto ML, we've got the registry so we can centrally register it. We've got the ability to annotate on there. We've got the ability to have versioning control. Clearly, we've got the ability, as Bonnie was showing, through non-production all the way through to production to be able to make sure that that project and that model is handled in the way that we would like. Off the back of that, even when we've got it in production, the thing that we want to guard against is things like model drift. So is it not performing as a predictive outcome as it should have been beforehand? What do we do about that model ready data set? And how do we switch the non-performing variable to the variable that we, that we require next to make sure it retains its predictiveness? So ML flow and the registry works really well for us as well from a value proposition. As an overview um, from what we're looking at, you know, we start with a business strategy just like anybody else does, and then we work towards a, a data strategy that, com that is complementary to the business strategy, and we look at the technical facilities that go with the back of that. What we're really looking for is how do we make sure our customers get the best experience? What do we personalize for them? How do we service them better? And we all use data to be able to do that going forward. And we use models. So what products actually resonate with the customers? Who are the people that we need to select for those products to make sure they're personalized to the outcomes that they're looking for? And what's the kind of contract strategy and what do they want to do with regard to that? And a couple of examples of this is we're known as a health insurance organization. We actually sell general insurance as well. Car insurance, buildings and contents insurance, life insurance, annual travel insurance. Imagine being able to get all of your insurance outcomes as a one-stop shop with the discounts that you would like to have as a customer. How much easier would that be than going to four or five different individuals to get those outcomes? The second one is, how do we make it more of a preventative outcome for you when you're looking after your health and well-being? Well, one of the things that we have offered is something called iInspect, and you'll forgive me here because this is a shameless plug. So iInspect gives you the ability to, when you see the optician to go for your eye inspection, they can also do a second inspection. That's an AI retina scan, and that allows you to have a look to see if somebody is going to have potentially other chronic illnesses, such as heart disease, Alzheimer's, some of the other ones in there with regard to high blood pressure as well. That's an offer free for Booper customers and $30 a head for individuals who go for their optical exams at a Booper network. So again, it's ease of outcome for our customers based on the information that we're providing through data. The next one is customer lifetime value. Um, it just gives you an idea of how much data we're actually using. So we're looking at 10 years' worth of data. Um, there are 4,300 states within that. And we've looked at a few likelihood scenarios here. Um, and you're probably going to say to me, well, some of these are fairly obvious. And they, they probably are, right? So you know, so if somebody's got cover within the next three years, um, a third of them are likely to have a child and therefore add that child to their cover. Within 10 years, two-thirds of them are likely to have a child and, and add those children to their cover. If somebody's got a gold account, um, and I'm looking at somebody like myself, which is the top end, over time they may determine that they want to downgrade that because for somebody like myself, I might not want pregnancy cover anymore, by the way. So I'll move down to silver. So we're also looking at that to see what those downgrades are and whether we're going to lose those individuals as well. And then there's the ancillary ones, right? People are finding cost of living quite difficult at the moment, inflation going up, mortgage rates going up. People then determine that they want to have a look at their health insurance and get the best value for it, or actually determine that they don't want to have health insurance anymore. What does that look like from a potential outcome over the next 10 years? Are they going to downgrade or actually are they going to leave? And what are we going to do about that? Because there's a cost in onboarding individuals and there's a cost in retaining individuals as well. So those are the outcomes that we've got from a customer lifetime value model. And we use lots of demographics. So you've seen age, you've seen location, we obviously look at some of the political situation as well. In closing, I'm just going to give you a summary of where we are and what we're doing. 
we actually believe in the strategic partnership with Databricks. We like the roadmap. As you said, we've heard ML um, Flow 2.0, and we like the future enhancements are there. We're clearly looking at some of the data governance outcomes and data management outcomes that are coming through from Unity Catalog as well. For our future, we're going to remain a cloud data platform, and we're going to migrate those legacy platforms over. We'll leverage a true customer experience with, with a desire for us to be able to support people from, from cradle to end of life. And some of the things that we're actually looking for, forward to doing outside of what we're doing at the moment is providing IoT device information. So we've all got watches, et cetera, that we're using to count our steps, check our blood pressure, et cetera. But what if you can use the IoT devices to see in the floor how bad the fall was for an aged care individual to know how serious it was to be able to call somebody to help them? Or within the mattress to check the moisture to see if they've got a fever and that we could alert somebody so much quicker. So there's so many of those that we want to do on top of what we've got at the moment. You're also seeing imagery already for skin cancer, early detection, et cetera. We want to increase those outcomes as well. And some of those offerings that we do through optical insights through your eye from a retina scan that looks at some of those further chronic conditions that we've got. And at that point, I'd like to say thanks for being a nice, wonderful and attentive audience. Thank you.